Verse number 10. Here's how it reads. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I, that I am speaking of being in need. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. A fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The word of the Lord. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. I'm going to say that again. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my Joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Oh, Jesus. You are the center of my joy. When I've lost my direction, you're the compass for my way. You're the fire and light when night are long and cold. In, in sadness, you are the laughter that shatters all my fears. When, when I'm all alone, your hand is there to hold. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my Joy. Oh, all that's good and perfect comes from you. 
Yes, it does. Lord, 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 your Lord of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Oh, Jesus, you're the center. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'll look to you, Jesus, because you're the center of my joy. Oh, oh, Jesus, you're the center of You are why I find pleasure in the simple things in life. You're the music in the meadows and the streams. The voices of the children my family and my home. You're the source and finished of my highest dream. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, Jesus, you're the center of my joy, oh, Jesus, <laughs> oh, Jesus, you, 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 you're the center of my joy, oh, Jesus. Jesus, 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 yes. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Hallelujah. And that's how Paul begins this letter, this last section of Philippians, with joy. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. He begins this final section the same way he began this letter of Philippians with this theme of joy. Let, let me remind us of some ways Paul has talked about joy in this letter. In chapter 1, verse 4, he assures the Philippians that he prays for them always with joy. In chapter 1, verse 18, even though some are proclaiming Christ from impure motives, he says that he still rejoices nevertheless because Christ is proclaimed. In chapter 2, verse 2, he asked this Philippian church, he says, complete my joy 
by being of the same mind and having the same heart. In chapter 3, verse 1, he, Paul tells this Philippian church to rejoice in the Lord. Last week, in the first part of chapter 4, we heard Paul say this, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Multiple times throughout this letter, Paul uses some form of joy or rejoice. Friends, this Philippians book is a joy-filled letter. And so here in this final section of Philippians, Paul, first of all, begins verse number 10 by stating his appreciation for their concern. He begins, first of all, with his appreciation for their concern. Verse 10, we see Paul's cheer, his cheer. He he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. And as I've stated already, joy has filled this letter. And I believe Paul is demonstrating to the church that no matter what your circumstance or situation in life may be, you have a reason to rejoice. Friends, I think that's not just a word for the church at Philippi, but I think that's a word for the British church on this Lord's Day. That no matter what may be going on in your life right now, you have a reason to rejoice. Oh, help me out, preacher, because you don't know what's been going out. You sure? I've got a reason to rejoice. Let me give you a few. He let you see another day that was not promised. He's blessed you with a reasonable portion of your health and strength. Yes, friends, you have a reason to rejoice, eyes to see, ears to hear, a mouth to talk, hands to feel, legs to walk. You have a reason to rejoice. If that's not enough, Paul says, let me give you the primary reason that you can rejoice in the Lord. In any and every circumstance, you can rejoice. It's in the text. He says, I rejoice in the Lord. I rejoice, here it is, in the Lord. Friends, Paul is letting us know that no matter what is going on in your life, the source of your joy is Jesus. He's not only the source of your joy, but he's the sustainer of your joy. He gives us, when he shows up, he gives us joy upon joy upon joy. Friends, your money might be funny, but Jesus is still there. Family may be going crazy, but Jesus is still the source of your joy. Work may be causing you stress, may be causing you to pull your hair out. Mine causes me to pull mine out. He still says you can rejoice in the Lord. This past week, I was in Indianapolis at the Gospel Coalition Conference. Went there all by myself. I had the opportunity to go to this conference. I heard some great sermons. Y'all would have loved these sermons. They were all at least one hour long. I was in heaven. (laughs) Pretty close to it. Then they had these breakout sessions, these workshops that you could go to, and they were enriching. But what was the most life-giving during this past week was I spent a lot of time in my hotel room alone. I had time to rest and reflect. And one of the takeaways for me from this past week, the Holy Spirit showed me that the reason that I oftentimes lack joy, or the times when I lack joy, it's because I don't treasure Christ. It's when I'm not treasuring the person of Christ that I lack joy. And instead of treasuring the person of Christ, I put other persons in a place of influence and power that have, and, and, and people, these, they have an impact on my state of mind and my state of emotions. I treasure them more than I treasure Christ. It's when I don't treasure the presence of Christ. 
I feel like I need the presence of others to fulfill me, to fulfill some void in my soul. It's when I don't treasure the work of Christ on the cross. I feel like he's not doing enough for me or that he should be doing more for me because of how I live, how I serve him, how I give, of how I love others. It's when I'm not treasuring his perfect work on the cross. It's when I'm not meditating on, on his blood that was shed for me. It's, it's when I don't treasure the very hope I possess because of Christ. His, his, the hope of him coming back one day and making all things right. The things that Jonathan prayed for this morning. The, no, no more racism, no more injustice. All that will be right when, when, when our hope returns. It's when I don't treasure Christ that I lack joy. Here's, here's my confession this morning. But here's the thing. I don't think that's my, the confession of Brandon Owen. I think there's some people in this room this morning that the reason you lack joy in this season of life is not because of what you're going through. It's not because of what's been done to you. It's not because of anything else. The reason you lack joy in this season of life is because you fail to treasure Christ above all. And Paul says, in the midst of being in prison, in the midst of you Philippians uh, uh, having opponents and suffering and internal conflict, you can still rejoice in the Lord because uh, you have to treasure him in all situations. And it's when I treasure Christ most that I sense that I have the most joy. It is when I'm treasuring Christ that I love my wife better. It is when I treasure Christ that I love my children better. It is when I treasure Christ that I love you better. It is when I treasure Christ that even in the midst of the worst situation, I still have joy. And Paul says, you have a reason to rejoice, and it's because of the Lord. Now, but there was something specifically that calls Paul to rejoice in the Lord. He says, it's because you revived your concern for me. What specifically caused Paul to rejoice, and he says it here, he, he, he amplifies, he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. What caused Paul great joy was because of the concern of the Philippians for his welfare. What, Paul, what caused Paul great joy was the support of others. What caused Paul great joy was this beloved community. What, what brought Paul great joy was knowing that he's not alone in this Christian race, that he has some partners, some quantania with him. Friends, when we were saved, we were saved into a family. We were saved into a community of faith, the church, family. All too often, though, we treat one another as if we're orphans. Friends, we are a family. We ought to love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, forgive one another, bear with one another, admonish one another, welcome one another, be hospitable to one another. We are a family. And what ought to bring us joy in the midst of horrible situations is, you know what? I have a family. And I think it's about time that we all renew and revive our concern for one another. For some of us, renewing our concern simply means fulfilling our covenant obligations to one another as members of this church. For some of us, renewing and reviving our concern for others means that we need to find some tangible means by which we can express our love toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. When we love one another, when we are concerned for one another, it has a way of bringing great joy. So Paul says, let me show you, let me share with you my cheer. But then in verse 11, he shares with us his contentment. 
his contentment. He says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatsoever situation I am in to be content. Paul begins, verse 11, with a qualification to what he just said in verse 10. When Paul brought up the concern of the Philippians, the Philippians could have understood it to mean that Paul was in need then, and he wanted them to be even more concerned about him now. And Paul is saying to them, that's not the case at all. Rather, I've learned to be content. In whatever situation I'm in, friends, what, what, what does it mean to be content? It means to be satisfied, sufficient, adequate. Contentment is the attitude of the fully satisfied person. To be content is to be ready to accept whatever, whatever God gives or whatever God takes. To be content is to be at peace with whatever one's situation in life may be. Paul teaches us something crucial about contentment. Notice he says, I've learned to be content. This was a part of his discipleship. He, he, what Paul teaches us here about contentment is that contentment is not natural to man. We have to learn it. We are by nature discontented people. We always want more. But one time I was preaching this text. I think I may have preached it to you all. I said, I said uh, every fall and every summer, Apple comes out with some new software, some new hardware, some new phone. Within 30 minutes, of their launch, they're talking about the next iPhone. I'm serious. Just go to MacRumors.com. It's, it's there. We, we're all discontent. We, 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 we buy a new house, and within the first year, we're thinking about our next house. By nature, we are discontented. I struggle with this even as your pastor in this church. We cross one barrier. Experts say that, that there, there are certain uh, uh, attendance barriers that we have to cross. The, the first one is like 50, and then it's 75, and then it's 125, and then it's 200. We cross one barrier, and before we have time to celebrate it, I'm thinking about what's the next barrier? What are we going to do to cross the next one? By nature, we are discontented people. And so we have to learn to be content. But how, how specifically... Are we to learn to be content? How do we learn to be content? Friends, Paul teaches us here that contentment is not learned through a textbook. You can't go to Barnes and Noble and get contentment. Oh, y'all don't go to Barnes and Nobles no more. You can't get on Amazon and get contentment. Paul teaches us that contentment is learned by experience. But Paul teaches us the only way you can become a person that is content is you've got to go through some stuff. Look, it's right here in verse 12. He says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Paul had to live through each and every one of these circumstances in order to learn to be content. Friend, it may very well be that God is allowing your current circumstance so that you can learn contentment. I believe God is doing this because especially in the church, too many of us are consistently dissatisfied with life. Just think about the number of biblical and Christian counselors there are. I, I encourage you just to do, just, just do a, a Google search right here in Wichita. They probably could fill up this church 
this building, this room. So I, I believe God sends certain, certain circumstances our way in order to show us that satisfaction is found in Christ and Christ alone. See, see you cannot put uh, 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 the source or, uh, uh, of joy into situations because situations always change. If you want to be a person that's always full of joy, you have to put your hope in, 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 in something or someone that is unchanging. In Christ. Because he is God. He's immutable. The just big word that just simply means he's unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So I think we ought to be careful. I'm not saying we ought to, don't ever pray about this, but I think we have to be careful about always praying and asking God to change our circumstances. Sometimes, God refuses to change our circumstances because he's using our circumstances to change us. Who tweet that somebody? Let's move forward. Paul shares with us his cheer and his contentment and this appreciation for their concern. But then he shares, before he leaves this section, he says, let me give you my confidence. He shares with them his confidence. And not only does Paul show us how he learned to be content, but he also shows us the power that enabled him to be content in every circumstance. Verse number 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, let me help us out here because I want you, us to know our Bible. And too many times we as Christians are guilty of quoting scripture and using it out of context. Let me see if y'all remember. Whenever you take the text out of context, all you have left is a... So you've been conned into thinking that you can just quote this verse and you will win your track meet. You've been conned into thinking you can quote this verse and you will magically uh, uh, lose 25 pounds while you eat a tub of ice cream. When Paul says, I can do all things, the all things that he's referring to is everything he just said in verse 12. In all of these situations, I know I can endure them because of he who strengthens me. That's what this verse is about. It's about contentment. Paul says, I can do all things. He's not referring to everything on the earth. If that were the case, he would be omnipotent, all-powerful. All things is limited to the context, what he just said. His ability to endure those, these various circumstances, these various situations, is not because of his own strength, but the strength of Christ. It is Christ who empowers him to be able to do all things so that he may find contentment. So I contend then that contentment is the fruit of a living in the power of Christ. Contentment is the fruit of living in the power of Christ. Tweet that too. Which means then, the, uh, the, 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 the negation of that is when I'm discontent, it's, mean, it's meaning that I'm not living in the power of Christ, but rather I'm living in my own power. Secondly, after Paul's appreciation for their concern, he moves now, we see in the remaining verses, Paul's affirmation of their concern. Paul's affirmation of their concern. First of all, in this affirmation, he shares 
that this was a commendable partnership. Verses 14 through 16, he shares about this commendable partnership. Verse 14, he says, it was kind of you to share my trouble. That word kind means good or well. It's almost as if he's con congratulating them or patting them on the back. He's affirming that they did a good thing in partnering with him in his time of trouble and affliction. It's almost kind of like bad grammar. You did good. He's, he, he commends them about their partnership. Let, let me put a pen in my manuscript right here. Notice what Paul says. He says it was good, it was well, it was kind of you to share my trouble. That's what we need in this beloved community. We need to be willing to partner, to share in one another's troubles, sufferings, affliction. Friends, it's okay to suffer. And just because you're suffering doesn't necessarily mean you did something wrong. Let's share. Let's partner with one another in times of trouble, affliction, suffering. That's all. Paul says he commends them on their partnership he, because they were an exceptional partner. He says, from the very beginning, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Paul says, no other church partnered with me in the beginning except you. Here's why we ought to find this exceptional. Remember, Somewhere around 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, Paul tells us Philippi was a, a part of Macedonia. And he says that the churches in Macedonia, he talks about that they were not a wealthy, well-to-do, privileged church. No, 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 no. This was a poor church. But yet, they still sent a financial gift to Paul so that they can see the gospel go far and wide. And Paul commends them. He, gives, he talks about this commendable partnership, but then he gives a caring purpose in verse 17, a caring purpose for why he received their gift, why he took uh, their gift, even though they were in a bad shape financially. Verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Paul clarifies that he's not seeking out their gifts for his own benefit, for his own self-interest, or his own selfish ambition. Rather, in receiving this gift from this poor Philippian church, he is focused more on how they will benefit from giving the gift. What Paul here is doing, by the way, remember at the beginning, we said this Philippians letter was a friendship letter. And what Paul is doing is that he's showing them our friendship is not just one way. It's mutual. You give, I receive, but I receive for your sake. He says, I accepted this gift for your own profit or gain. That's what fruit means. Their gift was evidence of their relationship with Christ and their commitment to the mission of Christ. 
The, their gift was evidence that God was working in them and through them. And for this reason, Paul accepts their gift. Friends, this is an important lesson. This is the part of the message that I did not want to preach because this is convictional for me. Oftentimes, I don't want to accept gifts from y'all. Some of it's pride. Some of it is feel, feels like I'm, if you give me something, I'm in debt to you. Now I owe you something. I've told you before, I'm working on this. Be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. <laughs> but here's the problem. When I refuse to accept the aid, assistance, gift of others, I potentially uh, uh, get in the way or I block the blessings that God intends to send your way. Friends, when people give to us, God sees their gift, God knows their heart, and he honors their gifting. When a believer gives, God rewards them either here on earth. Let's balance this out because y'all have heard enough from prosperity preachers who have told you, give and you're going to be and you'll receive here on earth. That, that, that ain't always true. Sometimes God's withhold his blessing for eternity. That's why he says, great is your reward in heaven. Sometimes God will bless you immediately here on the earth, but sometimes he waits and says, I'm going to give it to you in heaven. So friends, let's humbly receive the assistance of one another, if for no other reason, for the benefit of the person giving. Finally, in this affirmation of their concern, he gives them a comprehensive promise. Verse 19, and my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul knows that this is a needy church. They're in poverty, but yet they did not use their financial situation as an excuse not to partner with Paul for the sake of the gospel. Their poverty was not an impediment to gospel generosity. So Paul assures this church at Philippi that his God, this God of all sufficiency will supply every one of their needs. Friends, God takes care of his own. And Paul is certain of this. Friends, I could testify on and on and on about the faithfulness of God. And I can tell you by way of reading and by way of experience that God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Did I tell y'all what happened to me uh, a, a couple of weeks ago I was, when I went to uh, just outside of Atlanta? Did I tell y'all? Say no. Good. So I was, I, 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 I've been tired, y'all. Some of y'all are like, what? Tired. Get some culture. I've just been tired. And so uh, the Southern Baptists, uh, since I'm a church planter, they, they said, hey, we want you to come up to our headquarters um, for this orientation. 
Um, and so they, they, they brought us up there. They, it was, they paid most of the expenses. They, they flew me there. Uh, they, they put me up in a hotel. Uh, uh, God showed me a lot of favor. Everybody else had to share a room. Uh, I got my own room. <laughs> is the Lord not good? <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> yes, Lord. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm not going to tell y'all what I told them to get that room. <laughs> uh, ask me at the back, ask me at the back. And so um, they put me up in the hotel, and they fed us well. Um, I, I mean, food upon food upon food, snacks upon snacks. They even took uh, us glow golfing. No, not glow golfing, to top golf. There it is, top golf. I can't tell you what it is because I did not go. I was tired. So anyways, I get there. So I, I'm just going to tell y'all. Don't y'all tell anybody else. And if you're listening to this on podcast, don't you tell nobody else either. I really didn't want to be there. I was tired. I got all these children at home. You know, I, 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 I really don't have time for this. I, I don't. I don't want to be here. The, uh, they call this uh, sin network orientation. It's for new church planters. I'm like, y'all, I've been doing this for almost four years. You four years too late. So I, I just had a, I just, uh, my attitude wasn't great. I did not want to be there. I was not content. Mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> and so anyways, I'm like, you know, I'm bad, y'all. This ain't it bad? These folks don't pay you for everything. And, and I'm just up here just complaining and angry. I get there. And so uh, uh, Jesus dealt with my shame. <laughs> and so uh, I, I get there, and we're having a good old time. At least some of them are. And... Um, the president of, of what they call the North American Mission Board, Sin Network, um, he, he pulls the guy who was running the thing to the side. The, 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 the guy is telling us this. He comes back to the stage. He says, Dr. Izell just came to me. That's the president. Um, and he says, you know what? I, I really would love to bless these church planters. They are just on the front lines of everything. And so I want to bless them. I'm like, oh, it's church people. How are you going to bless me? Because normally it's some chicken, you know, or something like that. That's what church people do. When they say they want to bless the pastor, they give us some chicken. Hey, I'll take y'all's chicken, by the way. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Cause it's, it's hard out here for a preacher, so I will take, I will take your chicken, okay? So, so anyways, he says, I want to bless them. And so they go talk to the comptroller, the money man, and they say, we're going to bless every one of y'all with $500. <laughs> Woo! I just got content in Jesus. <laughs> Not knowing that my battery was about to go out in my car. Not knowing that I was going to have all these unexpected expenses. When I, when you, I had this plan. Y'all know what preachers do when they get money? Buy books. <laughs> We have so much fun. <laughs> Don't you want to be a preacher? Here's all my point, though, y'all. I went there unexpected, and God, y'all remember what I told y'all? Remember what I say the same thing over and over. Y'all remember that wonderful promise God gave me on Oliver Street? You preach the gospel, I'll take care of the rest. And my God will supply every one of your needs. Okay, y'all still, I told y'all I could testify on and on. Y'all just added another five minutes to the sermon. Hey, 2014, roughest year of my life, our marriage, everything. And so you know what I do. So, so God is working on me. He, I mean, God just breaks me all the way down. And and so I said, y'all, I told my wife, God is telling me I need to trust him more. And so I'm, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to leave my job. I'm going to stop working full time. My wife is no longer going to have a BMW. Not that, y'all, black man working. I got the mic. It's my turn. My turn. <laughs> and so here's the thing. Bill, Bill still got to get paid, though. All I know is I heard God's voice telling me, trust me. 
I still got a mortgage to pay, still got a light bill to pay, still got car notes to pay, still got gas that needs to be paid. I still got children that eat me out of the house and home. I still got bills to be paid. And so, Lord, how am I going to do this? I cash out my 401k. Mm. <laughs> Go to seminary full time. Eight months later, that 401k is gone. During this time, I'm finishing up seminary, and I'm talking to this church in Wichita who's asking me to come plant a church. I'm broke. I'm in debt. Don't know anybody in Wichita. But God keeps opening these doors. Come to Wichita. During this time, remember God, I heard God's voice tell me, trust me. Here's what happens. My wife is over there. She will tell you this. She goes to the the mailbox. A note from a former member of the church we went to, a check is there for $1,000. Here's the thing. That came right when I didn't know how our mortgage was going to get paid. Go to the mail again. I started liking going, checking my mail. (laughs) Somebody from Wichita, I'm still living in Texas, sends me another check for over $1,000. Because next month came around, and I still didn't know how I was going to pay my mortgage. But God said, trust me. Get to Wichita, still broke. And he just keeps blessing and blessing. Y'all, I'm preaching at West Evangelical Free Church. And I'm just sharing about the goodness of God. I told him, listen, we, it, we, it's been hard for us financially this 2014. I, I, I don't know how God's going to provide, but he's doing it. And he's taking care of it. I'm testifying. I'm giving God praise for what I'm about to do. I mean, for, for what he's done. I'm not asking for any, anything. Somebody after the church, after service, and y'all know how much I love greeting y'all after service, they come. And they said, you know what? We got an unexpected tax refund. They put a $1,400 check in my hand. By the way, this stuff never happens to me. I'm one of those people. But God reminds me. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And my God will supply every one of your needs according to his riches and glory. This, this section is actually, Paul is using all kinds of, of financial uh, undertones here, giving and receiving. Uh, when he says, I seek the fruit, I told you that word means gain or profit. He's, talk, he's talking about money here. And friends, what Paul wants us to know by way of extension is that God will take care of you. Be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Y'all have heard me sing this this way. I'm done. Worship team, come back. Y'all have another song, I believe. Here, here, here's what the old church used to say. I know the Lord will make a way. There, you can help me preach. Yes, he will. He'll make a way for me. He'll make a way for you. I know the Lord will make a way somehow. And there are so many of you in this room right now who can testify that you know the Lord will. Why? Because he's done it before. Why? Because he said it in his word. God will provide. Listen, if he'll do it for somebody like me, He's got to do it for you. He says, God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and go. Look, notice what Paul does. Paul knows that they are poor. And he, he reminds them that their God is rich. Here's the good news. Here's the shout. And then we're done. 
When Paul says, according to his riches and glory, here's the shot. Let me show you. If you come to me after service and tell me about a need you have, if I'm able, I can only supply your need according to the resources I have in Bank of America, which are very limited. If you go ask your mama, your daddy, your, your, your brother, your sister, your cousin, uh, uh, if you go ask one of your friends if, if they can help supply your need, meet some need, they can only do it according to the extent of their resources. It's limited. But Paul reminds us that God is able to supply every one of your needs according to his riches and glory. Maybe the reason you ain't shout right now is because you forgot that his riches are inexhaustible. His riches are inestimable. His, uh, 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 his riches never run out. His riches never depreciate. His riches, you don't have to worry about them ever being affected by the stock market. You don't ever have to worry about his riches being affected by the value of the dollar because his riches never run out. That's the God we can trust. Let's stand to our feet. Our hope, our, our contentment is in Christ alone. If you are here today, we want you to know this hope we have, this person of Jesus Christ. If you are here today and you have not yet trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior for, for forgiveness of sins, we, we urge you, we plead with you, don't wait, don't hesitate, don't delay. Trust in Jesus today. Put all your faith, your hope, your reliance, your confidence in Christ and Christ alone. No one else can make you right with God. No, not, not, no person, no amount of good works or good deeds. Only Christ alone is able to save you from the holy wrath of God. How do you do that? Trust in him. Believe that he was the son of God died your death, took your penalty on a hill called Calvary. He died on a cross, was buried, and rose on the third day. And the Bible says, if you believe, you will have eternal life. Let's sing together about this Christ.